my brother was in the basketball game with me. If he was the one who had the cardiac arrest and I was standing there watching him, you know, unresponsive on the ground and hearing the AED say like no pulse found, like that, that would have like scarred me for life. Yes. Like I, I, I don't think I could have lived with that, especially with my, my mom doing CPR on her own kid and like hearing like no heart, no heart rate found from the AED, like, oh, that's awful. And that, the fact that, that ha- they had to go through that, like that's what, really like hurts me what's up there everyone welcome here once again to another episode on the podcast of the heart warrior project i'm Yelis Fass, a fellow cardiac arrest survivor and your host here on the podcast now in this episode i had the pleasure to welcome sudden cardiac arrest survivor and heart warrior derek purdy who survived at the age of 17 a cardiac arrest now i will leave it up to derek uh you know to to share how he or or when he had a cardiac arrest and who saved him in the conversation but i will say that i find it very important to have young people also here on the show to mainly highlight that sudden cardiac arrest there is no age on this sadly enough right um it can really hell happen to anyone at any age i mean it doesn't always you know you don't always need some heart related history so yeah it really can come out of nowhere And that was the case for Derek. That's the case for quite a lot of people. Yet, I hope as well that you can get out of this episode with Derek. As I, he is a really beautiful example of it. That it doesn't per se mean that life has to stop. Or that he can't be normal again. Or as close to normal as before, right? Sure, everyone's situation will be different. But I hope that by listening to these episodes uh, from Survivors you can find hope and as well support that you're not alone in this and you know the whole part that there are quite a lot of people actually who live a very normal life again like Derek and he's really an amazing example uh also I loved his you know attitude he has a very positive attitude towards the future and and all to, towards all this now as always to find any of the resources mentioned throughout this conversation check out the show notes which are in the description of this episode or you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash podcast and search for Derek one last thing before we dive into the conversation if you want to support this project if you want you know I mean I put a lot of time and a lot of money into this project and I do I mean honestly I do this with a lot of love I do this with so much love I really care about this project and I will continue to do this but if you want to support this project we got some really awesome merch you know this pullover is one for example we have this in different colors uh, we also have uh, pullovers with a logo or a design explicitly for heart warriors, for cardiac arrest survivors. Uh, so that is also a really uh, cool one. We also have mugs, a mug. Also, this one is actually quite new with the logo of the Heart Warrior Project on. And uh, a quote that I don't think you can read now, but I will leave that a mystery for you to discover. And this one we also have in red and in black. And then we also have another design for heart warriors solely. So again, for cardiac arrest uh, survivors alone, uh, with I'm a heart warrior on. And we also have that in different colors. And then we also have a t-shirt as well. So there is some merch that we have. If you are a heart warrior, you know, you're a cardiac arrest survivor or or if you're not, you know, and you're listening, uh, you're a co-survivor or someone who knows someone who is a survivor and you want to support this this project, uh, I mean, really, you have no idea how much it would actually help me to continue doing this, then check out our merch. And I will put in the description also a link uh, to find, you know, to be directly taken to the website. Or you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash merchandise to be yeah directly taken to the website or to that page. All right, having said that, please enjoy this conversation between me and cardiac arrest survivor and heart warrior, Derek Purdy. Derek, a warm welcome here to the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. It's uh, really good to be chatting with you. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Um... You know, it's been a couple months in the making since I signed up for the time, so yeah. excited yeah. to talk to you today. Yeah. Uh, so, 
I mean, I know nothing of your story, right? Uh, I just know that you survived the cardiac arrest. I am curious to know, like, what is the story? Like, when did you had a cardiac arrest? How, who saved you? Uh, yeah, can you, can you tell us? Sure, I'd love to get into it. So yeah. um, I, like many others, did not have any sort of uh, congenital heart defect, nothing that would have shown up on a test. Like no way that anyone would have ever known. So okay. I'll preface it with that. And um, I played high school basketball all four years. And uh, during my senior year uh, in a preseason game that we had, it was a re official game, referees and everything. Um, I, I, this is from my, um, obviously I don't remember the story because my brain kind of, yeah. you know, but this is from the accounts of what my mom said. But um, yeah. so essentially what she said is after I came out of the game, I started out first quarter, no problems. She said I came out and I started like rubbing my head and like I just looked unwell. And uh -huh. one of my teammates was like, yo, are you good? Like, is everything OK? And apparently I just fell over and um, right onto his shoulder. And then, wow. yeah, I started like, I guess, uh, throwing up and, you know, not looking well and then eventually stopped breathing. And so luckily for me, there was a retired paramedic there. And my mom is also no CPR. So the retired paramedic went and got the AED. My mom actually was the one who did CPR on me. So, wow. yeah, she, she's brave. Yeah, yeah, she, she's the one who did the CPR. And um, her and the paramedic, uh, they shocked me twice with the AED and eventually got it restarted. Yeah. And then the ambulance got there and took it from there. Um, I spent around 12 hours in a, uh, intubated in a medically induced coma after that. Uh, eventually woke up and was definitely out of it for a long time after that. But, um, yeah, thankfully I woke up and uh, was okay uh, cognitively and everything else. And uh, four days later, I had surgery to get the uh, ICD implanted right here, which I've had ever since. And, yeah. you know, it was a pretty long recovery, but I've been okay since. Wow. Wait, and, and how long is this ago and how old were you? Oh, yeah, sorry. I should have started with that. So this was actually in October 24th, uh, 2020. I was 17 years old at the time and I'm 20 now. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And okay, so you said that they that there's they didn't find any reason of why mm -hmm. this happened. Nothing. And they never did. They never found a reason. All the tests they ran afterwards, nothing. They never found a reason. They think that their prediction is that it was probably some sort of like genetic mutation, but they don't they don't know for sure. Yeah. There was no structural defect even after they looked, like wow. after the event. Yeah. Wow, so 17 years old. Man, that's mm -hmm. I mean, there's no good time to have a cardiac arrest, right? But when you're young, there's so much stuff that you're, you know, doing. Yeah. And yeah, it completely breaks your life for a while, right? So mm -hmm. how was your recovery, actually? My recovery, I would say the hardest part was um, like right after it got progressively better. But I really struggled with like just like feeling like myself again and like remembering things and like being like there. Like I remember I, a week after I tried to get back to school work and like, I just couldn't even like think straight. It, a week it, after. it really takes a toll. Yeah. Well, even two weeks. Yeah. I did try to get back to the week after, <laughs> but it took about probably, I would say like two weeks to three weeks before I even was like 80% there. And then probably about a couple months before I was back to a hundred percent, but it's really difficult because you know, in hindsight, I can say that I was improving, but at the time, you don't know if you're going to improve, you know, you don't know if you're sure. going to feel better. Like there was no way for me to know. I was like, am I really going to be like not able to remember th anything and feeling out of it forever? Luckily, yeah. in my case, it kind of came back after about a month or two back to full strength. But I mean, it was really scary and frustrating trying to, you know, because I was a senior in high school trying to get finish up my classes and yeah. finish out my high school diploma. And it was, it was really difficult for a couple months there. Wow. And when do you, you feel things started to become better? Probably around Christmas time. Um, like that was when I could say, like, especially turning into that new year, like 2021, I felt back yeah. to a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Thankfully they said, um, the, like, um, the, the workers at the hospital, they were, uh, they, they said it was like a miracle that I was able to come back to full strength because they said that given like, the fact that it happened out of the hospital and like the amount of time it took for the ambulance to get there, they said it was, I was really, really lucky to not only survive, but to, you know, get back to a hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, it's many times just a, a whole 
range of luck that kind of, you know, mm -hmm. allows us to still be here. I mean, luckily you Absolutely. had an AED. That yeah, is already exactly. huge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, wow. And how do you feel today, actually? I mean, I it's feel been great. now like four yeah, years. Three years. Yeah, three years. Yep, it was th three years as of uh, two months ago. I celebrated the <laughs> three-year oh, anniversary. Three years. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so I'm feeling good now. You know, um, luckily for me, about two weeks after my uh, cardiac arrest is when I got uh, accepted to college. So that kind of like took away from the, you know, I was able to think about that rather than think about the cardiac arrest. So that really helped. But yeah, it definitely was a um, quite the, uh, you know, event. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So today you feel pretty normal. I mean, despite having an ICD and, you know, <laughs> that's quite a normal. But besides that, you feel quite good again or yeah i do I, I do i was able to like i said I, once i got to like january of 2021 yeah. so i would say like two three months after it happened i was i felt back to normal um you know the only main difference that i had was um because of the cardiac arrest and the presence of icd yeah. unfortunately that was a career ender for basketball but you know besides that it was pretty good though like yeah not too many changes and like medication uh, do you have to take that too yeah yeah just uh the um like you know one of like the preventative medications that they like a beta blocker the, or yeah beta blocker mm -hmm. oh beta blocker yeah yeah okay. yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And you don't feel the side effects or they're quite minimum no actually they <laughs> in a way it kind of helped me because um when i was younger around that time i actually had a really really bad uh i used to get migraines like all the time and so when they when they put me on the beta blocker that it was nada laws when they put me on yeah. they put me on the uh, the beta blocker for the heart arrhythmias you know just as like a precautionary it also beta blockers also help with migraines so it, it fixed my migraines wow. so yeah. so in a way i actually got like kind of lucky out of it what are the odds right i mean yeah <laughs> really unlucky event of course what happened but you know yeah there's a little maybe some benefits to it i guess yes <laughs> yeah, yeah so it's really helped like ever since then wow in the yeah. past three years my migraines went from like here to like down here like i barely get them at all now so i got oh. really lucky <laughs> yeah well, that's good to hear actually <laughs> yeah and yeah, uh, i always joke with my cardiologist i'm like you should be a neurologist like <laughs> my cardiologist <laughs> and you said that you can't play basketball anymore right or not competitively uh, not competitively yeah. yeah i could play with my friends outside and stuff yeah. but um and my cardiologist even said he was like physically like you're fit to play but just from like a one like a legal perspective and mm. two like just like when you get competitive you know like if i'm playing with my friends outside then i can stop whenever i want if yeah, you're in like yeah. a competitive like organized game you know but yeah so I, i'm not allowed or well now i'm out of high school anyway so it doesn't matter yeah. but um in high school i was not allowed to play my senior season which was terrible and then but now i can you know play around with my friends and stuff but i'm not gonna lie after they made it so i couldn't play it, it uh you know for the team, I didn't really feel like playing anymore at all. It kind of like took it away, you know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, ruined it. <laughs> yeah. And and is there anything else like a major thing that has changed, or even a minor thing, right? That yeah, that has changed in your life since your cardiac arrest. Yeah. The one thing, and I think people with ICDs will definitely be able to relate to this. The one thing that's really annoying is like security, like airport security, like any sort of metal detector, stuff like that. Or like where they, because my, my device is uh, like, it's one of the ones where like metal detectors wouldn't really affect it. But what can affect it is the, um, the magnetic wands, you know, like those security wands that they sometimes place over. So I have to be really careful with like, anytime I go to an airport or like, go to an amusement park where they anything where they try to or like into a basketball game anything where they try to wand you i'm like i have a card that says like basically do not wand me <laughs> but that, it's, yeah. it's stressful <laughs> i mean i have that card too but i, yeah. I mean what happens like i don't think anything happens when they do that right it just gives a response to the um i've heard that wand. it can like i've heard that it can uh like cause an effect on the um it can affect the uh device yeah Mm -hmm. I've heard, I don't know if it's like uh, permanent, but it can send like a signal out. So I mean, could be, could be, but okay. I thought actually it didn't, but maybe 
maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. Uh, on my on my card, it just says like, do not place magnetic wand over the device. It uh, may cause adverse effects, but I don't know what the adverse effects are. Uh, and anything else? Anything more that you know has made things maybe a little bit more difficult, or or just things that has yeah have changed? Yeah, I really like um, going to the, uh, you know, weightlifting weights and stuff like that, going to the gym. And so I've had to be a little bit careful because, you know, you don't want to, like, throw it out of position or anything like that. Any sort of, like, chest workouts, I, I'm, I'm really careful, which is kind of not fun because, you know, I see all my friends, like, trying to, like, max out on bench yeah. press or anything like that. And so I'm, like, trying to be careful and, you know. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, besides that, I know a lot of people uh, struggle with the, um, you know, like having the device, I mean, for me at first, it was really um, almost surreal. Like you have this piece of metal in yeah. you forever. <laughs> it's pretty surreal. It's weird. And yeah, it definitely is. And then but after, you know, a few, like after a year, a few months, you, you know, you kind of start to get used to it. It becomes like a part of you in a way. Um, you know, at least uh, I don't know how it is in uh, Belgium, but, you know, in the U.S., we don't have the, the free health care. So, that, you know, it's the costs of like, routine procedures every three months to like you know they do every three month they check it and having to pay every so often is not fun <laughs> wow yeah okay so in belgium we're a bit more lucky in that sense that we get paid the majority of money back of mm -hmm. those costs so is it wait every three months you have to go uh i we I have a device that hooks up to remotely actually so yeah. every three months i have like a remote check while i'm sleeping and then every six months i go and right. um in person yeah yeah, yeah. okay yeah mm -hmm. yeah and uh don't you find i mean do you find it annoying the icd like to live with it or do you feel like it's not affecting you a lot uh, from a day-to-day -day basis? I would lean towards, like, overall... I mean, obviously, you know, it, it's there, and it's, like, a minor annoyance, but um, I would say that the annoyance is minor, and I, I wouldn't say it causes a huge impact day-to-day. -day. At first, I was definitely, like, not a fan of it, especially because, you know, the first few weeks, they have you where you can't lift your arm over your head, so that was, uh, that was like, the worst couple weeks, but, um, you know, now... You know, because you, you're stuck here, you can't lift it all. I remember one time I was taking a shower and I almost did, and I was like, you know, because they say it can mess up the healing or whatever. But um, yeah. So, no, I um, I, I wouldn't say it's the end all be all. It's it's okay. And yeah, I'm able to make do with it. Yeah. Do you actually know why they placed? Because I also have an ICD here, but I know mm -hmm. a lot of people who have a site ICD. Do you know yeah, yeah. why they placed yours here and not on the site? Yeah, so they were actually going to do the SICD on the side. Yeah. But the reason why they decided to do this one is because they wanted to do the dual chamber ICD. Uh, okay. It's the one that can has like the pace feature. The reason they decided that is because they were running a test right before my surgery, and they found a slow response rate from the heart, something with the electrical signals. I'm not sure the exact test, yeah, yeah. but for some reason, my response rate was slow on it. And because of that, my cardiologist decided it would be better to uh, get the dual chamber I see and place it up here. Mm, okay. 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 Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, there's yeah. always a good reason or hopefully a good reason yeah, why yeah. they choose mm -hmm. um, either here in the chest or at the side. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, just curious, like, do you feel like it having an ICD cause you're so young, right? I mean, you're 20. Do you feel it has yeah. affected your, I don't know, self esteem or your self image? Uh, cause you don't see that on young people uh, often. Or, yeah, which is good, but you, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Do you feel that it has affected you in some way? Honestly, as far as self esteem goes and like self confidence, I got really, really lucky because I've actually been uh, uh, together with my girlfriend since we were like 15 years old. Wow! And so I, you know, I, she, okay. yeah, yeah. So she was, you know, at that point we had already been dating for a couple of years, and so she was, you know, the fact that she didn't care made me okay with it, you know. She was really super supportive and, you know, so, yeah. Has it made thing? Yeah, how was just the relationship between that time when you had a cardiac arrest and you were in the hospital and recovering? It is a challenging time for, for you know, everyone, but just, yeah, how, how was that time for you actually and your girlfriends? Yeah, it was, um you know, obviously a rough time. Uh, she was there for me the, the whole time. She actually... um 
it was during you know during COVID, so they had very limited uh, visitors in the hospital. But she was uh, still able to find a way, <laughs> so she found a way to get in there. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> it was supposed to be like parents only. But she was like, "No, I'm not going." <laughs> and so she she thought she uh, she was able to convince them to let her in for a little bit, and so that was fun. Unfortunately, uh, you know, because at the time I was so out of it, as soon as she left, I forgot that she was even there. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I know from the pictures that she was there, though. So. <laughs> yeah, so she was there. I will say this, though, since we're on the topic, um, because, you know, when you have a cardiac arrest, your brain just shuts down. I don't know about you, but when, during mine, I didn't I don't remember that week even. I don't remember Same. anything. Same. And so I think, honestly, in a way, it kind of protected me as far as like, uh, you know, like having mental trauma from it. I think my girlfriend and my mom who did CPR on me and my brother who was on the basketball team who was sitting right next to me when it happened, I actually think, unfortunately, I feel really bad, but you know, mm. that, I think the toll on them emotionally was a lot tougher than the toll on me. And that is one of the things that really like gets to me, like out of all, out of everything that, you know, happened, the device I can live with, mm. you know, the the fact that I had a cardiac arrest I can live with, but the fact that it had that big impact on my mom and my brother who was there, who were both there. And then my girlfriend who was watching the live stream of the game, like that really, you know, hurts. Yeah. And in which way does it hurt for you? Cause I mean, I can't, I, I can't understand what you mean actually, but yeah. In which way do you, does it hurt actually that, that they had to go through that? I just mean, I just mean like, I couldn't imagine if, I, let's say, because my brother was in the basketball game with me, if he was the one who had the cardiac arrest and I was standing there watching him, you know, unresponsive on the ground and hearing the AED say, like, no pulse found, like, that that would have, like, scarred me for life. Yes. Like, I, I, I don't think I could have lived with that, especially with my my mom doing CPR on her own kid and, like, hearing, like, no heart no heart rate found from the AED, like, oh, that's awful. And that the fact that, that ha they had to go through that, like, that's what really like hurts me yeah seeing a, to me. yeah a live but, and that's uh, a yeah. situation happening before you and then if it's your son or your brother you know damn yeah that's so mm -hmm. crazy right yeah rough it really is yeah and my girlfriend like i said it was an organized game and they live streamed all the games at my high school and my girlfriend and my grandparents were both watching the live wow. stream and they saw it wow yeah they ended it before like every, they saw me like fall over on the live stream and then they ended the live stream because, you know, <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was, it was rough, but I was lucky though. I had a support system. A lot of my family lives down here in, in Florida. So I had a lot of people at the hospital that were there waiting for me to wake up. So, and hold on, you, do you actually have a recording of the video then? No, I do not. I, they deleted it. They deleted it? Yeah, I was kind of upset because I wanted to like see it, but they deleted it. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, it must be if you would have the footage, it must be quite shocking maybe to see it yourself too. But somewhere... Right, but I would have wanted to watch it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, yeah, because yeah. for you and for me, we know nothing of that event, right? It, you know, for the people who were with us, it was very imprinted in their memory. But somewhere just seeing how was I looking or just having some kind of clarity on that situation might i also feel like i i think it might must have been it, it might be triggering to watch it but i would be curious to also see it happen to me <laughs> uh but yeah triggering for sure though i think okay no, it definitely would be i mean me personally though i um i stuff like that i mean if it's me i i can't say whether or not it would be that triggering or not because i just don't know but i, I still overall would have wanted to watch it <laughs> Just to see, out of curiosity. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. And how is your mom doing today? Like, your relationship between your mom, how is that today? Me and my mom are super, super, super close. Um, I always, always come back here. For always the, be you know, close? I, I live a, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I always tell people that, uh, <laughs> this is going to sound so bad, but I'm going to say it anyway. Yeah. We have, I have two brothers, and I always tell people that I, I'm her favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I actually sure, am. Own I don't it. know if I actually am, but I say it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So my brothers are going to be watching this once it gets uploaded, and they're going to hear it. But <laughs> I, I don't know if I actually am, but I'll, I'll say it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, we've always been super, super, super close. Yeah. I know. I think honestly, out of anyone in the world, she was probably the one who was most affected by the um, cardiac arrest. I know that it's still 
bothers her to this day. She tells me that like whenever she hears like an whenever she hears like an ambulance, like that sound is really like triggering for her because you know the ambulance coming for me and everything. So like I, I even see it on her face like when we're driving and there's an ambulance that comes by. She like that sound like just the sight and sound of an ambulance is really really triggering for her. Did you had to seek any therapy or something, or did your mom? sought any therapy to deal with this or how do you feel that you as a family work through this a bit by just talking about it yeah yeah i mean i think honestly i didn't seek therapy um i think the main way that we kind of like coped around it is just like letting um you know letting time heal you know after a while I, like three years isn't a long time but you know, as the months went on and the fact that I was able to make a full recovery really yeah. helped, you know, because even though the event happened, once I was back to full strength, they weren't, if anything, they were happy that I was back to full strength. And, you know, so that, the and, you know, we had, uh, that was around like peak, like COVID time as well. So that was going on, like, and we were all in, you know, my mom's a teacher, works full, my dad works full time. My brothers are in school. I was in school. So, the fact that we kept ourselves busy definitely helped. Um, you know, we were dealing with other stuff, you know, with like the whole COVID. I mean, everyone was dealing with that. And so that kind of like, yeah. in a way, like we were so busy, we didn't really have time to be like, you know, think about it, I guess. But um, yeah, as time went on and especially, like I said, once like 2021 hit and I was back to full strength, that kind of took a, even though the trauma was still there, like the day-to-day -day sadness, at least from my end, I, I, I can't speak as much for my mom or brother, but I think overall by that January, most people, we were all, um, you know, okay. Yeah, yeah. And do you still talk with your mom about these at times? Oh yeah. All the time. She, we talk about it. Um, you know, I love to hear like the, um, cause I'm very curious. I love to hear like the details of like, you know, what was I looking like before it happened? Like, you know, what, what happened at the hospital? Like, um, yeah, for me personally, like I'm, I, I probably should have said this at the beginning, but I'm studying um, to be a doctor now. Really? Oh. Uh, wow. So l learning about, the, yeah, yeah. So learning about like the medical side of what happened. Uh, interesting. Um, yeah. You know, and like the specific details is really interesting to me. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, sorry to interrupt the conversation. I was just enjoying my hot chocolate from this uh, amazing mug that we made for the project in my very comfy hoodie here. If you want to support this project uh, because you find that you gained something out of this episode or any of the other episodes, then yeah, consider supporting the project. It would really help me out a lot and it will help me to continue doing this. So we got some really awesome looking hoodies, different colors. Uh, this one is quite new with the logo from the project. We also have uh, hoodies with a design explicitly for cardiac arrest survivors with I'm a heart warrior on. Uh, and then we also have mugs. Really, really nice mugs. This one is also new with the logo from the project on with a quote that you probably can't read because the lens, the camera is not focusing on this. And then we also have this mug but with a different design Again, also explicitly for heart warriors, for cardiac arrest survivors. Now in the description, you can find a link to get involved, to buy the merch or to make a donation. If you rather want to make a donation, we also accept that. So again, check out the description. You can find the link there or you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash get involved. All right, having said that, let's return back to the conversation. Wow, I mean, good luck with that for sure, right? That's a uh, ambitious thing uh, to go yeah. for, but that's cool, very cool. Yeah, must be also interesting along. Yeah, this the cardiac arrest is. A... What were you gonna say? Oh, I just want to say it must be when you go through the studies, must be interesting to learn about the anatomy and about the hearts, and then maybe also learning more about yeah. your mm -hmm. case, you know, and why it might have yeah, happened. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. Like, honestly, I would say that I was interested in medicine like a little bit before my cardiac arrest, but I would say the turning point, like the cardiac arrest was a huge turning point in my life. And it's honestly like my main motivator for why I want to be a doctor because, it, you know, during that time, like, obviously that's like when you have a cardiac arrest, that's you at your worst. And 
you know, when you have the modern, med like modern medicine and the wonderful like staff at the hospital and the doctors, nurses, they're the ones who ultimately saved me. So yeah, yeah. being able to, you know, pursue a career where I can do that for other people is like definitely what I want to do. So, well, that's a beautiful motivation to go for it is actually, that's really, mm -hmm. really beautiful actually. Yeah. I don't know if it's for you the case too, but uh, I still, after three years, like, because my girlfriend performed CPR on me when I had my cardiac arrest. But when I talked oh, with her, really? yeah, yeah. I, I still learn things even after three, yeah, it's been three years for me too. Even after three years, I still learn things about what happened that day. I, I don't know if it's, is that the case mm -hmm, for you so too? <laughs> There's so many gaps, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. It's cool. We have a, we have, we have a couple similarities in our stories. Then we both were three years ago, and we both had it was a loved one who did it. Yeah. The CPR. So that's yeah. interesting that you, that you share a similar story. But yeah, I I agree with that sentiment. Like I like I said, me and my mom we talk about it like still to this day, and so I find out new things yeah. all the time about you know yeah. the exact events that went down. Uh, hmm. Wait, uh, one thing more before I actually will go to another question that I was curious to ask. Uh, did you say that, or did I recall that correctly, that you celebrate your third rebirthday, like, uh, uh, like uh, not too long ago? Yeah, I call it like a, like a, like death anniversary, I or guess, de like yeah. an anniversary uh -huh. of the, yeah. the death of, yeah, because because you know technically I did flatline, uh, so I guess you'd call it like a rebirthday too. But yeah, it was October twenty fourth, twenty twenty, so three years ago. Yeah. What did you do? Did you do anything special or how did you celebrate it? No, um, this year was, I did actually do something special. I was, um, I haven't been able to, in three years, I hadn't been able to come in contact with the paramedic who helped with the CPR and helped with, um, mm. you know, getting the AED and all that. I hadn't been able to come in contact with him, but I made it my mission on October, this past October 24th to try to find his contact information and get in touch with him. And I, we actually, I was able to, and we, we had this beautiful conversation where I, you know, thanked him and oh, we were able to talk about wow. it for a little bit over text. And it, it really actually, after three years, that was something that was really heavy on my mind was that I didn't give that guy a thank you for everything he did, you know, literally saved my life. And so the fact that I was able to come in contact with him and have a conversation with him kind of gave me this sense of closure yeah. after three years. So that's what I did this past. Yeah. Wow. It was really, um. Probably one of the best things of the year, honestly. Definitely a highlight for sure. Ah, uh, that's so good that you did that, actually. And it must feel like some kind yeah, of closure. In a way. I, yeah, it, it really is. Yeah, it's a sense of closure. I, it was um, it was actually a teammate's grandfather, so I was able to get his contact information from my coach from high school. He happened to have his phone number, thankfully, so he gave it to me. And I didn't, I didn't even know if he'd have the same phone number, but I sent the message regardless. And yeah. I was able to talk to him for a little bit, so it's great. How come after three years you wanted to send that message? I mean, I wanted to send that message even before that, but I guess I don't know if it was something subconscious that was just like maybe not even want to like like talk to about. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. maybe it was something subconsciously that just like didn't want to like like open that book, I guess. But I always like wanted to. I think, I don't know, if it, was, it was probably a combination of just not getting around to it and then combined with just like the, you know, like how, what do you even say to someone who like saved your life? You know I mean? A stranger who saved your life. It's like, how do you even like Where spank you them? You know, yeah. like, so that, yeah, exactly. So I, I just never did. And I felt guilty about it, honestly. And, and then um, being able to do that definitely helped though, provided, like you said, the sense of closure that really made me feel good about it. Yeah, well, very strong that you actually did send that message. Because exactly, like, where do you begin by, yeah, thank you. how do you thank that person? <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm, right, like, there's nothing you could ever do to repay uh, a person who saved your life, you know, yeah. the stranger too, not even a, not a family member, not a friend, just a, you know, just a teammate's grandfather who decided to be a hero that day. Yeah, well, thank God we have people like that in the world who can do the right thing at the right moment, like yeah. your mom, mm -hmm. right? And, and yeah. Him, yeah, 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 mm -hmm. yeah, I was really fortunate that I, you know, because if you have a cardiac arrest out on the street when you're running or, yeah. you know, some people would have a cardiac arrest, not even exercising. Like I was lucky that I had it in a 
environment where there were people there that knew how to help me and then an AED <laughs> in close proximity. I'm a huge advocate for AEDs. I think AEDs should be everywhere. I mean, that CPR obviously helps keep the circulation going, but the AED is what shocks your heart back into rhythm and saves you. I am convinced if that AED was not there that I would not have made it through. And so I, I definitely, um, I'm, sh I'm sure fellow cardiac arrest survivors share the sentiment of just being really like want wanting AEDs everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm totally with you on that. Yeah. I mean, you might have survived it, but the chances, the percentage of that will have been dropped a lot, right? Without the AED. So. Exactly. And even if I did, even if I did, who knows if I would have had the same outcome as far as like cognitive function yep. and coming back to full strength, you know? Yep. Mm hmm. So, yeah, I was really, 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 really fortunate. Mm. So, let me throw another question at you. Is there anything that you wish your cardiologist uh, would have taught you sooner uh, or, you know, something that you wish you discovered sooner about your ICD or, you know, having survived the cardiac arrest that could have helped you earlier on? Honestly, I think I, I have a really, 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 really good cardiologist. He, you know, he told me, like, he gave me, like, the playbook on everything that was going to happen, everything that, you know, everything that I could do. And honestly, it was a lot of good news. I thought the restrictions were going to be a lot stricter because you read online and you see all these things you can't do. And I, I think maybe because it's because I'm young, maybe it's because of this specific type of device that I got. But a lot of the restrictions that you find online, I um, he said that in my case, maybe it's because I don't have an actual heart condition yeah, per se that could have to do like the, yeah. you know because a lot of people they have a condition that goes on with it but a lot of those restrictions that i thought i was going to have because you know you go down this rabbit hole online and yeah. you see like oh like can i do this can i do that and all the questions i had I, I felt like for the most part i had pretty good responses on um you know everything he told me what i couldn't couldn't do and he did a great job of being informative but i, I was for me because i even though I try to be an optimistic person in that situation, I was kind of worried about like what I wouldn't be able to do. And I, I felt like that first appointment after I got pretty good news about like, you know, things that I could do. Like I, I thought there was a chance I wouldn't be able to like work out at all or exercise at all. You know what I mean? Cause I'm not at that point, you know, I'm 17 years old. I'm scared. I don't know. And you know, when I was, when he told me like, yeah, you can still work out, you can still exercise, you know, you, obviously within reason being careful, but you know, like the, the fact that I could still be active at all after, and that was great news for me. <laughs> so I, I can't thank him enough. He, um, yeah, he was great. Must be a relief to have heard that, right? That what, what you found on the internet wasn't yeah. exactly all the way true for your case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of people, you know, just aren't medical professionals and they're giving their opinion and yeah. they're talking about their specific situation yes. rather than yeah. the you know, everyone's situation. And I don't blame them for that because, you know, feel free to share your story. But, you know, in my case, since I'm a warrior, I, um, I tend to worry about things like that. So I, I thought that there was a chance I wouldn't be able to be active at all. And hearing that I could from him was made my day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a big worry and a real one, right? Because mm -hmm. all of a sudden things change in your life and you yeah. kind of, yeah, you're fearful of how much more will it all change in the future. And now, you know, is there when, because, you know, we don't always feel good all the time about what has happened to us. Is there something that helps you today when you might have, a, you know, a bad day because of something with your ICD or something about your cardiac arrest uh, that helps you emotionally to go through that? Yeah, I would say the main thing that I lean on is just the gratefulness of surviving the event. I mean, you look at the statistics and you see these numbers of like, I mean, I don't know the exact, but I've seen numbers between like nine and 16% as people survive out of hospital cardiac arrest, especially I had a ventricular fibrillation for mine. And so I, I, the statistics for that, for out of hospital survival rates, I think is something between like nine and 16%. And so when you think about that and kind of get the perspective, I, I tend to take the perspective of gratefulness is like, yeah, I may have st to deal with the ICD and I may, have to, you know, deal with some of that stuff, but just the, I, the fact that I'm alive and still able to experience things and was able to come back a hundred percent mentally yep. and cognitively. And the fact that I was able to make a full recovery, I, I tend to focus on that because, you know, unfortunately the reality is, is that 
for most people that isn't the case. And so even if I have a bad day, uh, you know, and it has to do with the anything involving the cardiac arrest or the ICD, which is pretty rare. Usually, I mean, usually, if, like I said, for the most part, it's been fine. But I, I tend to just take that perspective of gratefulness. Yeah. And after three years now, do you still feel that there's something maybe difficult to communicate to the people around you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely think like I have a few people in my life. I won't, I won't uh, say any names in case they watch this, but um, <laughs> a few people in my life who um, they look at it and I don't blame them because they're doing it out of love for me, not anything else. But they have they think like they think of it as like a disability where like I can't like they try to tell me things that I can and can't do. Like I had someone tell me like, oh, like because I, I was going to like a, a somewhere where I was like a trail or something where we were going to be walking around some sort of event where we were going to be walking around all day, um, like a park or something. And it was like a big thing. And they were, it was supposed to be hot that day. And someone said to me, like, they were like, Oh, with your heart thing, is it going to be okay for you to walk around in the heat all day? And it's like, yeah, yes, I can walk around, <laughs> like, you know, things like that. And it's, there's situations like that, that have happened before. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not even gonna, honestly, I'm, I'm not going to lie with you pretty especially because I'm a young person, you know, and I have a lot of people that are like older than me that, you know, want to tell me what to do. But uh, no, uh, I've gotten a lot of people like kind of telling me, oh, you can't do this. You can't do that. And it's like, yeah, you don't even know. Like you're not my doctor. Yeah. <laughs> so that that's kind of frustrating. But I feel like as I've gotten older, that's happened less because, you know, once you're an adult, people don't <laughs> tell you what to do too much. But, you know, just like it's it was frustrating, though, like, it's like, you know, you're not my cardiologist. It's like, why are you trying to yeah. put limitations on me? But especially because it's like, you know, I know, like, I know my, I, I was very thorough with uh, my doctor and, you know, with the research I've done. And I, I know what I can and can't do. And so I, I, it definitely bothers me, even though I know that they're just trying to be nice. But it bothers me when people try to put these limitations or anything on me <laughs> oh yeah and you're totally right for that being you know that bothering you right because it's i mean yeah sure mm -hmm. it might be them trying to be helpful but it's just totally not helpful <laughs> it's really annoying yeah it's really it's, it's really, really annoying. It's, it's just annoying it's it just like it just makes you feel bad <laughs> so yeah <laughs> what would you say to maybe that kind of person who does this what would they what could they do instead that could actually be helpful uh, honestly i mean i hate to say it but just not say anything because <laughs> <laughs> like there's nothing i mean i i get where they're coming from but like any reasonable person is gonna already have had those conversations with their doctors and know what they can and can't sure. do you know like anyone who r really cares already knows yeah. <laughs> they already had that conversation on their first appointment so like there's nothing that someone who with no background in medicine can say that would help <laughs> that would like, you know, there's no advice that they could give that would actually like make a difference. So uh, even though they're coming from a place of kindness, it's not, I just don't want to hear it. <laughs> I usually just tell them I'm like, uh, I'm like, I know my, I talked to my doctor and I know about my limitations. I just keep it <laughs> short and sweet. Short and sweet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I say, thank you though. <laughs> well and instead of maybe imposing, uh, an, uh, you know, some piece of advice, try to instead maybe understand, you know, trying to understand maybe what, you know, you went through instead of just giving advice. That's a different thing. And yeah, that can feel a lot nicer than just yeah making yeah, suggestions of what you should do or giving advice when they don't know so much. Yeah, about it. the first time it happened to me. Yeah, the first time it happened to me, I tried to go into this whole thing or like I tried to explain like what happened, why it's a, it was an event, not a condition, you know, and like the thing is, is like people and it's not their fault, but they just don't get it. Like they, they aren't able to understand. So now I just keep it short and sweet. And it's, you know, thank you for the advice. But yeah, like I know my limitations <laughs> is usually what I go with. It, but yeah, so it, like you said, it's if it didn't happen to you and you're or you're not like a medical professional or you're not like a close, close family member of someone that happened, then they just, excuse me, for the most part, just really do not mm. understand. And one thing, don't you find it frustrating that you don't know why you had a cardiac arrest? Yeah, it does. Cause I mean, if it's genetic, I would like to know, cause someday I plan to have kids and I don't want them yeah, to have yeah, a cardiac yeah. arrest. So, it, you know, it's, 
it's I would love to figure out if there's you know like a if there's a genetic component I'd like that's like their prediction but they don't know it, it does uh, like I'm, I'm all about closure and you know being able to like rationalize and understand situations and the fact that there is no rationale yes. or understanding for why this happened it's frustrating. It definitely um I mean maybe it was a fluke maybe it was genetic but there's no structural thing wrong with my heart and while that's great for the future for my life you know the, I would love to know the exact cause especially if it's genetic so that I could you know take that into account and you know either way though my future kids I will definitely take any sort of precaution as far as mm -hmm. like you know early testing yeah. on their hearts and anything like that just because since I have the, you know they'll have the family history from you know what happened to me so I will definitely be you know keeping an eye on that for them and making sure they get all the preventative tests and diagnostic tests to see if they have any heart things going on but it's yeah it's definitely hard to kind of rationalize when you really don't know the cause <laughs> yeah yeah it's like your arm all of a sudden fell off and you're like how the hell did that happen and there's no no real clear reason right, right. it's like what the hell <laughs> but mm -hmm. i mean it's different right but yeah what about you did you ever get a cut yeah so when i was six years old i was diagnosed with a heart disease and uh that yeah oh, okay. disease led eventually to the cardiac arrest um so i do have a heart disease i have a clear reason why it happened uh do you find closure in that ah that's it's a bit of an ongoing thing so i don't think i find closure in it uh no because i don't know the eventual you know how my life in the end will look with my heart disease how much more it's going to get worse yeah um <laughs> But at least we know specifically where it's coming from, so we can also treat that more specifically. So in that sense, right. it can be, I guess, more helpful for my cardiologist. Um, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, that's true. It definitely is. <laughs> but if you have no no sense or no idea at all why it must have happened, that must be very frustrating, I, I could imagine. Yeah, And hopefully, you know, in some years with modern science evolving all the time, who knows, right? There might be an answer at some point. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I don't know if they'll ever... My thing is, even if medicine gets better, like, at this point, do you think they'll even try to look? I mean, unless I press the issue, which maybe. I might... But we'll I mean, see. there's a lot of people yeah. like you who did not have any history of heart disease or anything, you know, of an indicator. and. People, doctors wonder, like, mm -hmm. why the hell did that happen? So I do think maybe they might be very curious to know as well. Yeah, that's true. I didn't think about it from their like the perspective of the doctor, of like, maybe they're curious. Yeah, because yeah. my, th my top thought on it was unless I, like, really try, like, why would they care? But you're right, they might be curious. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Especially with my age, I, I, I laugh every time I go to the cardiologist. I'm like the yeah. youngest one there by far. It's not even close. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm a little bit older than you. I'm, I'm I like thirty, but but I'm still very young. Mm -hmm. You're super young, right? <laughs> or when I was in the hospital because I had some uh, quite a lot of surgeries on my heart, and I'm you know laying in the in the room with another person. It's always an old guy. <laughs> it's always some old person. It's never. Old, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's funny. Yeah, yeah. So a last, you know, question maybe that I want to ask you. Is there any last, you know, tip that you would share or want to share to any survivor listening that you feel has been helpful uh, in your life? Or just something, a last thing that you would like someone listening to know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually have two. So I'll start with... Um... I mentioned it earlier, but I think the key, I mean, for the people like you and me who are uh, sudden cardiac arrest survivors, I think that in order to be able to cope with it, we have to put emphasis on that survivor part of sudden cardiac yes. arrest survivor. Um, thinking of it that way that, you know, you're a survivor. Um, you were one of the lucky ones who, you know, whether it be the AD or the CPR, or you were in close proximity to a hospital one way or another, um, you know, you're alive here today. And I think just being able to, you know, take it from a sense of gratitude and be grateful that you could still experience day to day life, even though it may be affected from your cardiac arrest or your heart condition or your ICD, just the fact that, you know, you're a survivor and you were able to fight through it. I think you just got to stay positive and 
uh, just be grateful that you're still able to experience things. That's that's how I am, at least. That's how I cope with it. The fact that, you know, the fact that I'm still alive, I definitely, like, I, I can't thank the people who helped me enough for that. And um, I think, um, especially in my case, it just really depends on the person, but I'm a, I'm a pretty religious person. And, uh, you know, so for me, like, being able to thank God that, you know, I had the opportunity to keep on living. So I think uh, I recommend just for any cardiac arrest survivor to just focus on that survivor part of sudden cardiac arrest yeah. survivor. Um, and then the last thing I will say is I highly recommend to fellow sudden cardiac arrest survivors to really go out and advocate for AEDs, uh, whether it be in policy or any sort of, if there's any event going on for sudden cardiac arrest awareness, just making people aware because I mean, statistics show that as far as like sudden death, I mean, cardiac arrest is the main way that one of the, if not the main cause that that, you know, one of the main ways that that actually happens. And it can happen to people at any ages, any health background, anything. And, um, you know, in my case, an AED was what saved me. And I think I personally have advocated for AEDs um, in my school system Good. and nice. stuff like that. And I plan to do it, you know, continue that for the rest of my life. And I, I advise or encourage um, other sudden cardiac arrest survivors to do the same so that we can help other people be survivors, you know? Well, that's amazing that you do actually want to voice the need of AADs and the importance of that even more out there because you're such mm -hmm. a beautiful example of, of what AADs can accomplish, right? So exactly. I'm 100% mm -hmm. in with what you just said, yeah. And, you know, thank you for being here on the show and for sharing your story. And, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's good to see that you have such a positive mindset and uh, that you are being a real survivor. So, yeah, keep on being a good uh, survivor. And, you know, maybe at some point we'll do a round two and, and chat again because I will be curious maybe in a year or so to see how things are. Uh, but for now, thank you, you know, for being here on the show. Absolutely. I would love to. I really enjoy talking to you today. And that concludes this conversation with cardiac arrest survivor and heart warrior Derek Purdy. I hope that you gained something out of this episode, maybe some insights, lessons, some hope and some support. Now, for any resources mentioned in this episode, check out the show notes, which you can find, as always, located in the description. Or you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash podcast and search for Derek. With that, thank you for being here, for joining me and Derek here in this conversation. Oh, and before you take off, uh, once again, you know, check out the merch that we have. Uh, we got some really cool looking hoodies. The one that I'm wearing here is quite a new one. I mean, this design is quite new. We have it in different colors. Uh, we have mugs. This mug is also quite new, this design with a quote on it, different colors as well. And then we also have another design uh, explicitly for cardiac arrest survivors only with I'm a heart warrior on. And we also have hoodie, uh, a mug, from that and a t-shirt you can find a link also in the description uh that will take you to the website to find the merch or if you want to leave a donation that is possible too but again check out the description to find a link or you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com uh, slash get involved all right with that maybe i get to welcome you again on another episode here on the podcast of the heart warrior project until then this is your host Yelis Vaz signing off